for the Lompoc City Council for Tuesday, September 15th, 2020. To order, Madam Clerk, roll call, please. Councilmember Mosby? Present. Councilmember Starbuck? Present. Councilmember Vega? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Gilda Cordova? Here. Mayor Janelle Osborne? Here. As we had no closed session, I believe there is nothing to report from closed session. So please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mayor, staff tonight does have one item that we would like to request the City Council add to our agenda. Um, you have before you on the dais a copy of a proposed agreement that was submitted to the city today by the county um, for installation of a ballot drop box at this, on the city library property. Uh, this would be in front of the library between the bicycle rack and the book return box. Uh, the city asked us to enter into this agreement today, so we do not have time to put it on tonight's agenda. Um, and also, they want to place the box on October 5th, which is before our next meeting. So the only way for us to have the council approve this agreement would be to add it to the agenda tonight. Um, it does require a two-thirds vote of the council to just add it to the agenda, and then the item will be heard at the end of our meeting at the end of our agenda tonight after all of the other agenda items are finished and um, so i'd request that the council add this item by a two-thirds vote which requires four yes votes of the city council do i have the four votes council member cordova you got my vote all right yes Councilman Vega? yes i'll give your fourth thank you so uh, Osborne, Mayor Osborne will be third and Starbuck fourth. So we will add that to the very end of the agenda. It will become item number eight and um, we'll take public comment at that time as well um, once Mr. Malavi presents at that time. All right. Uh, just as a reminder, the county has determined that in-person public attendance at city council meetings is prohibited. Gathering in violation of the County Public Health Officer Order 2020 12.5, effective July 14, 2020, and that is why it is either written communication or call in communications. You can call in during oral communications or public communication of each item at 805 875 8201, and we'll have three minutes to make your comments. Um, Alternatively, you can submit comments to um, the current agendas by 4 p.m. on the Tuesday of that agenda to s underscore Haddon, H-A-D-D-O-N, at ci.lompoc.ca.us as written. The council meeting is available via channel 23 Comcast, the radio KPEG 100.9 FM and live stream from our city website at cityoflompoc.com. Click the city council button and then view city council meeting live webcast. Back to the agenda. The presentations uh, made elsewhere were proclamations honoring the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution and in support of the United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women presented as video to those organizations. City Manager Report. Um, thank you, Mayor. I do not have any report tonight. But thank you. Councilmember Mosby. This is a simple question. I know there's been a little bit of a hiccup on the uh, parkland and fields. Um, can you maybe shout out to the public what's going on and what we're trying to do and what you're trying to accomplish right now? Actually, I'm gonna, I was getting some information. I'm going to see if our public works director, Mike Luther, can come up and give a quick update. All right. Thank you. Good evening, Mike Luther, public works director. 
I'm assuming your question revolves around the tall grass and the parks. Um, so we've had an issue right now with our, our uh, mowers. We typically have three large mowers, one tractor for off-road mowing and two ride-on mowers. Uh, currently, one of the ride-on mowers has been taken out of service because it's, um, it's around 12 years old and it's just um, too far gone out of repair. So that one's out of service totally. The other ride-on mower has been down for about um, two months waiting on parts, has a wiring issue. And so we were down to the ride on track, the tractor mower, and it is also currently broken, waiting on parts. So we don't have any large mowers currently. We are in the process of um, getting proposals to replace the one mower that's been taken out of service. Uh, so we're working on that. And we all are also working on replacing um, some vacancies. Uh, we're in the process of hiring two maintenance workers currently. Of the, we have three vacancies in maintenance workers. Uh, we're currently have offers out to, for two of those positions, and we're reviewing the application pool for the third, see if there's any qualified applicants there. But we also have a, a current employee out, out on medical, and then another one was in an accident last week, an auto accident, so he's been out for about a week. So we're down on equipment and down on employees currently. Thank you. I know a number of people from the public are asking, and thank you for that response. Seeing no further questions, we'll move to public comment on consent calendar items. This is for consent calendar only. If you would like to comment on any item on consent calendar, you may call in at 805-875-8201. Eight zero five eight seven five eight two zero one, and remember to mute your PC, TV, or radio when you call in and are put through. While we wait to see if there's any calls, consent calendar is considered to be routine and will be enacted after one motion in the form listed below. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless good cause is shown prior to the council vote. Any items withdrawn from the consent calendar for separate discussion will be addressed immediately before the second oral communication near the end of the meeting. Were there any written communications on consent calendar? Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, Mr. Ron Fink sent a, um, a comment to uh, the entire uh, council. It was also delivered to staff and um, posted to the city's website. Which item was it? Item number three. Thank you. Again, the number to call in if you would like to comment on consent calendar is 805-875-8201, 805-875-8201. And remember to mute your PC, radio, or TV when your call is put through. Seeing no one call in, we will close public comment on the consent calendar and bring it back to council for discussion. I would like to have the city clerk note that on item three, I will be voting no. Um, because it was combined, I do wanna clarify, I support the future agenda item request process, but again, I don't support the Economic Development Committee being moved to the chamber or the related tasks that need to be done there, so I will be voting no on item three. Council Member Cordova. Um, I had a question also on item three, um, and I do want to clarify that um, I fully understand that the funds have been uh, allocated or allotted by the majority of the council, and I'm okay with that, but what I am concerned with is that our general plan still reads that our, that our um, economic development committee is um, part of our general plan and part of the city in policy number 3.6 it says that the city shall appoint an economic development committee so I would like to recommend that the council also 
adopt to change the general plan and make this change so that it doesn't um, create a misalignment um, uh, with our general plan. Councilmember Mosby. The, I believe it's already planned to come back with a general plan, if I remember correctly, that it has to come back, so it has to come through the natural process on that. Um, my uh, suggestion here is uh, with the minutes that we're approving, um, there isn't a date on the header and it's also listed as a special meeting. I don't think it was, I think it was a regular meeting, but there's also a... It was a special meeting because the uh, agenda was not posted to the website. Okay. But there's also not a date on it. On the top? Yeah. So... Okay. But it's also identified in the in our agenda as a regular meeting, so... Okay. They were conflicting. Other than that... Council Member Vega? I don't know if we got a proper response on the general plan. I don't know that it needs to be amended. Um, can we get a response from Mr. Malawi? Yes. Sure, sorry. Um, the general plan does currently say that the city shall appoint an economic development committee. So that's why the staff report says that if the council adopts this item tonight, the next time we bring a general plan amendment back to the council, we will include the changes to the general plan to eliminate the economic development committee there too. Okay. In that case, I'd like to make a motion that we accept consent calendar. I'll second. Councilmember Cordova, I believe you still had a question. Yeah. So um, I don't want to have to pull this item, but if, if I do, then, then, then I'll pull it. But I don't think it's a natural process for us to put the cart before, before the horse. And so if we're going to make the change, which I'm okay, the majority has ruled that, then I think the general plan amendment should also be made simultaneously. And how many changes to the general plan have we had this year? I don't know for sure, but off the top of my head, I'm, we, have, we have zero this year. And we are allotted at four per year. Right. And for, for our answer to say that it's a natural process, it shouldn't be natural process. And that's my issue with a lot of the things that we do is, is that we're going to willfully make a change, but then we're not going to change the general plan. We haven't made any changes. So, so why can't we go through and align things and actually do things structured the way we should be doing them instead of the will of, of whatever, you know, we want. So I'm not sure, um, city attorney, if I need to pull this then for discussion. Uh, well, if the council wants to further discuss it, then we can pull it. But I think a couple of options would be that you can include in your motion a direction to staff to bring back a general plan amendment uh, after this is approved to just specifically remove those parts to eliminate the EDC and the general plan. Or you could just move to table this until we amend the general plan first and then bring this back after that occurs. Um, how long before we anticipate that the general plan is actually going to be brought back? I mean, we're right now are, even with the restrictions, I don't see what the big rush is. It's going to happen. I get that. It's already been voted. But I just think that we should do it the right way. Uh, if we wanted, if you wanted to bring back a general plan amendment that solely eliminates the EDC, that would just it would just go through the planning commission and then come to the council, and that could be, I don't want to speak for the planning department, but yeah. a couple of months or. It's not my intention to to have a general plan amendment that just tackles this. I just disagree with the way that we do things. I think that if we're going to change and it's not going to be part of it, but it misaligns or it no longer aligns with our general plan, I think that it should be something that we, that we adopt and that we do at the same time or simultaneously. I don't see why it has to come back and now we're in disorder, which seems to be a common thread. So I don't know. Councilmember Vega. Um, you know, I can amend my motion, but I want to clarify here. We can bring it back with the changes to the general plan at the same time, but go ahead and move forward with this at the same time. Yes, you can okay? do that. So that's my motion. 
Mr. Mosby, do you second the amended motion? On, on your amendment, it's not uncommon to do what we're doing here. It's not necessarily caught before um, cart before the horse. I think we could stay with your original motion and they can move forward with the natural amendment. I think one of the things is a cost factor. If you pull one item singularly forward, it's a general plan amendment. It's expensive and we're doing something uh, as a progression, a tag on. I think there's nothing wrong with moving forward with your original motion. I don't necessarily support your modification of your motion. I, I think we can get this done now and then it can come back for, for more of housekeeping on a, on a generalization. Councilmember Vega. Yeah, if I could just get a clarification from Mr. Malawi. Does that sound uh, sensible the way it's written? We can go ahead and take care of this tonight. You can adopt it tonight, but I think what staff needs direction on is after you adopt it tonight, do you want us to bring back a general plan amendment that just solely eliminates the EDC to make things consistent? Or do you want to wait until we bring back a larger general plan amendment and then we'll include this EDC elimination in that larger general plan amendment? I think my motion is going to be to clean this up tonight and go ahead and include and bring that back as a separate issue. Let's bring it back and just clear up the general plan as an amendment. Okay. I'll second that. So it's been moved and seconded. I still vote no on item three. <laughs> I will now call for a vote for a consent calendar. And the consent calendar passes five zero. Council request is item number five, discussion and direction to staff regarding potential amendments to sign standards relating to temporary signs. And we have our planning manager, Brian Halverson, to present. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. Uh, at the last meeting, there was a request to bring back uh, a discussion on our sign ordinance. Uh, specifically relating to temporary signs. I have a short presentation that I'm gonna give, just kind of introduce the item, get a discussion going, and then some direction to staff on what type of amendments you're considering. Again, the council request was at the last meeting, which was uh, September 1st, and that was um, relating to temporary signs, but specifically political signs the existing sign code, which was adopted in 2016, there were some cleanup items in uh, 2019, but the, the main ordinance was adopted in 2016. Um, that, there's no reference to political signs in our current sign standards, but they are considered uh, temporary signs because you know they go up for a little while and then they come down. Uh, temporary signs, as you see in your staff report, um, we can regulate them based on type of sign, not the content. For example, I'll show a couple slides on uh, some temporary sign examples like a banner sign, a yard sign, etc. We can regulate the number, maximum area, height, lighting, and, and also if we want to require a permit or not. Uh, a sign permit is required for some temporary signs, um, depending on the type and the size. For example, banner signs and bus bench signs require a permit. Yard signs uh, that are just greater than 12 square feet also require a permit. So if it's under 12 square feet, no permit. Here's a couple examples on your screen that you can see. The one on the far left is a banner uh, affixed to a building. And the whole purpose of that is to announce a business that's coming soon. Uh, a lot of times the business is not ready to put a permanent sign and so they'll put up a banner and um, that does require a sign permit. I think the main reason for that is we're trying to encourage the business to put up a permanent sign instead of having banners up. The one to the right is a, a yard sign, very small, does not require a permit. A uh, couple more photos here. On the left is a A-frame or a portable sign. Um, that doesn't require a permit. 
The one on the right would be considered a yard sign. That's a larger one. I showed you earlier the small one on the right. And then the one on the right, uh, the one on here on the right is a larger yard sign. That would, based on the size, would require a permit. There's an example of a bus bench sign. Uh, it sounds like there's a desire by the council to amend our sign ordinance. So I just wanted to put up a, a little timeline if, if that is the, uh, what's given the direction to staff. Um, tonight we're discussing the potential to amend the sign ordinance. Um, October 14th, um, we have a planning commission meeting. Um, we are already uh, working on some cleanup items on the zoning code that was initiated by the planning commission. It went to a meeting last month and, or actually it went to a meeting in July, it went to a meeting this month, and it's going to another meeting on October 14th. Now, depending on the direction of the council tonight, um, we could roll in, if they're minor, we could roll in um, some additional amendments uh, to what has already been um, considered by the Planning Commission. We'd have to republish in the Lompoc Record newspaper, um, but we could roll that into the meeting, uh, next meeting on October 14th. Uh, depending on the, the level of those um, amendments. And then it could come back to the council November 17th, uh, second reading on December 1st, and then an ordinance would take effect 30 days later, December 31st, last day of the year. Um, finally, just in conclusion, um, we're asking for you to provide direction. If you do want them in the signed ordinance, uh, specifically temporary signs uh, is what we're referring to tonight. That does include or conclude the staff presentation, and I'm available to answer any questions at this time. Councilmember Mosby. So, Mr. Halverson, at, at the library, um, there's a sign that's posted up there in a stand there and stuff. What, what does that follow under? What category? That would probably be a some sort of yard sign if it has post up. I can go back to my photo. So it could be uh, a yard sign like the bottom right because it's on posts. It would most likely wouldn't be a banner because a banner by definition is attached to a building. So it would probably and, be a yard and, sign. And I think it's an appropriate sign. It's something that's needed. I mean, it's, it's sizable. It's on posts. Um, yeah. But I, I don't think there's any permit. And a lot of times the sign is, stays up for a length of time and it's advertising and promoting uh, essentials. Some was about the meal program uh, for lunches and, and, and important information that gets out there. But do you do you know anything else about um, what category is it falling? If it if it lasts three or four months, is it falling under any category here? That so right now the sign code, unfortunately, because sometimes it's better to have specific language than vague language. The temporary yard sign, which it sounds like we're talking about the library. Uh, there's no timing on how long it could be up. Now, banners, there is timing. That one on the left on the building, it's 30 days. You can do it twice the calendar year. Or uh, if a business requests, they could do it a total of 90. It gives them time to, to save or to budget and put up a permanent sign on the building. So uh, is there, That yard sign, there's no time limit on that. Is there any permit needed for that big yard sign? I would have to actually go out there and measure the sign. I don't know what the dimensions are. It, what, is the, what is the dimension that it'll allow before you need a permit? So greater than 12 square feet would require a permit. Okay. And it, it's bigger than that. Um, but I think it's an appropriate sign, and I, I think that in some cases, granted this came up <clears throat> during political season here, um, but there are other signs in the community, other nonprofits have these up that that are important messaging getting out there. And I don't think that they're the blight that's written in the book, they are important messaging. Um, I, I know there are some signs that are exempt from this sign ordinance completely. And it's generally about government signs. And I think you start wandering down certain levels of slippery soaps and we've seen banner signs come up recently with the COVID uh, issue going on right now and some of them are hanging by arms and legs and falling down and tattered which violates our stuff but they're not under this and I think we start getting on slippery slope when we're violating that first amendment where this sign's okay and that sign isn't and when we start qualifying it as a government sign is okay 
but a private sign isn't. I think it's very important that we treat everybody equally under the law, but likewise, getting back to the, the specific issue, I think we need to modify a little bit and look and, and take into some of the examples. Uh, you know, this zone ordinance was not perfect and it was told, made well aware that it can come back for clarification. I think now that we've seen it out here, I think signs in, in, in my discussion, some of the, the signs that are out there right now, we need to take those as examples and maybe modify a little bit to accept kind of what the community is doing. Um, it, it's not a blight. As an example with the library, I don't think that's a blight. I think that's a, a good example that we could, with, with a little bit of modification, allow it to continue to be there. Councilmember Cordova. Um, Brian, when was the last time that we um, made changes to or adopted the, the current um, sign ordinance? Yes, so it was originally adopted in 2016, and then last year we did some just some minor cleanup items. It was nothing major, um, like fixing mistakes, and that was last December that you, the council approved those. Amendments. Right, and I do recall that. Um, I, I think that it's interesting because the staff report calls it out, and as I recall it, this item was brought forth because, and it was specifically called out as, political signs that we wanted to discuss the ordinance or the, the sign ordinance um, and discuss political signs, which we now know and we should have known that, that that's not part of our sign ordinance. It's either, you know, like you said, the, the different types of signs that we have as temporary signs and yard signs and whatnot. Um, so I think it's deflective to, to give an example of other businesses when in reality what we're here to discuss is, is whether political signs can or or are or are not considered permanent signs, temporary signs, or whatever the case is. But as I understand the ordinance, if you go above a certain size, that's when you pay the fee, correct? Yes and no. It's, it's based on a couple factors. So it's the type of sign, but it's also the size. Mm -hmm. So the table that I included in the staff report um, lays out when a sign permit is required and when it's not. For example, a banner sign, it's always required. A bus bench sign, it's always required. But then if you look at a portable sign, that little sandwich board sign there on the left, mm -hmm. that doesn't require a permit. You'll see if you follow that chart down, it says no. Mm -hmm. A window sign, no, doesn't require a permit. Of course, there are standards, that, you know, there's sizes and uh, whether it can be illuminated and how many. And then lastly, the yard sign, um, if it's less than 12 square feet, no sign permit. If it's greater than 12 square feet, then it, it does require a sign permit. So, and that sign permit um, is good for 30 days? No. Well, there's let's no. talk about that. that. There's a little bit of ambu ambiguity in the code on that. And that's um, what I wanted to clarify. For banner signs, there is a specific time. It's 30 days or the 60 that I mentioned for the calendar year or 90 if it's in, for a business that's prepping for uh, to be opened. But a yard sign, it doesn't put a time period on that. Okay. So. Okay, thank you. And there is a bit of a additional complication when it comes to yard signs because not only does it have above or below the 12 square feet, but you have to factor in um, lots of less than an acre or larger than an acre, and you also have to then factor in the maximum if it's greater than or less than an acre. Yes, and good so, point. And so again, uh, the parameters are here, they're well defined. I don't think any of us should be surprised by it, especially the fact that council majority uh, passed this back in 2016 and it was added to our campaign handbook um, this year. And this is you know, something we're asking the rest of the community to follow. So. Um, you know, it's just reading and applying something that it, we should be honoring if we're going to expect the rest of the community to, to be honoring. And I will say that the fee is reasonable, especially given it's being charged for the permit, not for the number of locations we're placing it, which could be a burden if it was charged for every location it's being put. So. Um, I know it seems complicated, but once you read through and you map it out, it's pretty straightforward. And if you want to avoid 
all of the complications, you just keep it below 12 square feet and make sure that you know, you're, you're not trying to put something too big on less than an acre, as some of the signs already are. Um, I, I think the slippery slope is beginning to call out and make exceptions for things that the state, I mean, the US Supreme Court said exactly we could not do. And I know that other entities in the state allow for that, but I think they're in violation and just haven't been called out for it and, and may have to actually deal with that. So again, I think we acted early and often and are doing our best to stay within the type of sign, not content and not who or what the sign belongs to. Councilmember Vega. Uh, Brian, just as we said, we're looking for a little cleanup. We can't uh, change anything if we were surprised or want to, some of us are surprised. This is for the future. The future people that might get involved with political uh, aspects and they're not on the council, they're not incumbents. They're here, they're just out there uh, trying to do something for their community. So I'd like to make, keep it as simple as possible. Uh, the mayor stated some legalities and I don't think she's qualified for that to say that it may be illegal. I think that we should leave that to the legal experts. But I think for me, I think that we should clean this up to a point, or I'd like to suggest that we clean this up to include political signs as an exception, or at least note that so that someone else isn't surprised or other people aren't surprised or it doesn't come in from a complaint, uh, which is basically can be uh, included as, as a campaign uh, issue depending on how the complaint comes for. So maybe I could ask you a question on how we could uh, possibly make that change uh, without changing everything else as far as temporary signs. I'm gonna to defer to Mr. Malavi because I don't think we could exempt political signs unless we exempt all the signs, but I'm gonna to defer to Mr. Malavi on that. Yeah, there was a recent US Supreme Court case that says cities are not allowed to regulate signs by their content. So we can't say, here's the rules for political signs and here's the rules for all the other kind of signs, or here's all the rules and political signs are exempt because that would be taking the content of the sign and creating the rules based on what the content is. So you have to regulate by the type, yard sign, banner sign, all the yard signs have to have the same rules. All the banner signs have to have the same rules, regardless of what the message is or the content of the sign is. So, um, you know, as an example, if you wanted to just have no rules for yard signs, then you could do that. Um, and that would include having no rules for political yard signs, but then there would also be no rules for all the other kinds of yard signs. Thank you. That's not what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is uh, a way to entice the com community. We're over here trying to get people to run for office. Obviously, we have issues there also. Additional fees and restrictions and things for people that aren't connected to City Hall, but they're just inspired to help their community. That's what I'm trying to to uh, do away with here. So maybe the size of the signs is what we're dealing with. Plus we do have 90 days uh, before a campaign from which, you know, we're all, we've, we've filed and we can actually pay our fees and then we have 90 days to the election. So how do we box this up, Brian? So I'm actually asking for a little assistance here. Yeah, I would to, love to, to get create some assistance. This. Um, I'm sure you don't want any conflict. I don't want any conflict, I get it. I understand what the fee structure is, but. So how do we do this to accommodate our political structure without exempting uh, temporary signs completely? Sure, one suggestion um, that I think you could consider the council as a whole is, um, I did a little research and a lot of times plywood is, is purchased. Uh, the sheets that you see like in Home Depot, they sell them an eight by four. Um, so right now it is a little bit strict in the sense of, you know, something greater than uh, 12 square feet. So you could up the amount of square footage that wouldn't require a permit. For example, um, you know, those sheets of plywood, uh, eight by four, um, banner signs do require a permit always. Um, but you could, you could be more flexible if you wanted to, um, 
for example, not requiring uh, requiring a permit, but requiring a no fee permit. Before I came to the city of Lompoc, uh, I was in a jurisdiction that did no fee. So I'm just throwing it out there because <laughs> you offered some suggestions. So you could do a no fee permit. But I want to caution the council because, um, you know, you do want the city to look nice. Aesthetics are important. And you do want to avoid clutter. And you don't want to be too encouraging if the goal is for people to eventually put permanent signs up. So um, you have to be kind of careful about how far you take it because um, we do want the city to obviously look nice and we don't want people to get too carried away. So those are some suggestions uh, for those two particular signs, banners and yard signs. So since we can't ex exempt it according to the city attorney, uh, we could make some changes, but we could add a category that just for political signs, could we not without exempting them completely? I think that's what we're missing here in the ordinance is that we don't have a category addressing the political sign. Uh, you cannot create a category just for political signs because that would be creating special rules for the, the content of the sign. Uh, there are a lot of cities that still have sign ordinances that specifically address political signs and have special rules for political signs but they just have not updated their code yet since the, since the Supreme Court's decision in 2015. So those ordinances are actually unconstitutional right now. Um, so the regulations have to be on the type of the sign and not on the content of the sign. Okay, now the other part of it is you said temporary signs and the ordinance is meant to uh, keep from having clutter within our city, okay? so. We know that during the political time frames, that's pretty much pretty impossible, okay? Everyone's trying to come here and help their community or their school board. And we wanna make sure that it's positive. People have gone through great lengths to, to run for these offices. The city has spent money to encourage people to run for offices, whether or not uh, it's worked or not. Obviously, it hasn't worked enough. The districts have, put a, have infringed upon the people's ability to wanna to get you know, involved because the districts were meant to encourage more people to get involved and also they were trying to lessen the cost of running for office. So my issue is, okay, so if we're trying to reduce the cost by make, turning them into districts, then we're charging a fee and we're having them make, go get a permit. I understand it's all about size. So why don't we take a look at the size for political signs, okay? You're saying we can't even have a category. I find it hard to believe that the word political is illegal. When we do candidate handbooks and we have everything there that's there stating that, that you can do political signs and you can go and you can market yourself, you can hand out flyers. Caltrans even has their sign ordinance, which isn't as restrictive. So what can we do? Okay, well, I certainly can, uh, Council Member Vega, I can bring back um, some amendments to the Planning Commission um, with some more flexibility for the size of the type, specifically if I can get direction, are you talking about just banner and yard signs or just yard signs? Right now I have a photo up, that sign right there, that little yard sign does not require a permit, just as an example, so, so those so are around the town. If we go back to size, it's not really an issue with the size, you know, it's just a matter of educating. So a four by eight, you're right. I saw you at Planning Commission and you guys brought two boards up, a seven foot and an eight foot, and you're right, they sell the boards and the backboards on four by eight sheets at Home Depot, okay? So I think that's what you were referencing, okay? If you had a backboard on that, is, that, is there a permit uh, required for a size like that? Um, you know, and, it, and apparently right now we do Correct. require right now, a permit, okay. but Correct. I'm gonna go back to your planning commission meeting when you had a seven foot or a six foot board and an eight foot board, they don't make them in between. You know what I mean? You'd have to go and get them cut down special to for the ease of putting a backboard up, a piece of wood four by eight should be legal. And anything within that should be legal is what I'm saying, because based on the way you guys did a presentation, if someone wanted to put a sign up for that purpose. So I'm, I'm hearing that flexibility for the eight by four without a permit, is that something that the council well, wants? I'd like to see the flexibility in there. It doesn't affect me there. I just wanna, for the future, you know, hey, I'm not asking for any money back or any special favors here. I just want to make it easy to decipher. Yes, obviously someone went back with the size 
and everyone's the expert now. We have the former planning commissioner who's, who's the expert at everything and stirring the pot in the background. And that's not going to work for me. You know, we can do better than that. So that's what I'd like to, to propose, or at least find out what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, we're flexible and we're willing to come back. I, uh, and, just... a, and a no fee structure for that, for that reason, for that, for that issue. But that's not the main concern, okay? What I'm trying to do is make it easy for you to, to regulate at the same time. We don't need more problems during our political season. I'm sure you're pretty busy yourself, you know? Brian, it's only for a 90-day a period. Okay, so again, uh, are we looking at banner and yard sign or just the yard sign? I want to get some clarification on the type of um, signs that you want flexibility. Is it all of them on the? Well, you know, no, I don't want to get but too deep here. What I want to find out is you made a reference to a backboard of four by eight, and you're saying that a permit would be required if you used a piece of wood or not a piece of wood. Yeah, the eight by four, because it's 32 square feet, anything greater than 12 square feet would need a permit. Yeah. Aside from the size, if we mounted a, a banner type on that board because of uh, the way the weather is here in Lompoc and whatever, for durability to last 90 days, otherwise you'd have ripped banners all over town because the wind would rip the grommets out. Um, maybe you could clarify, you're the well, expert here. Right now the yard signs don't have a time period, so that's very flexible, okay. banners do. So I think the flexibility for the yard sign is good for the city, um, but you just, you want to have some flexibility where a permit is not required for these larger signs. Is that correct? I'd like to see that. Yes, yes, sir. Okay. okay. I mean, it's not, a, it's not a big negative. You know, I'd just like to see a little bit more flexibility and that since we can't have a separate category for political signs, because in the past there's been large banners really large banners and no one has said a word about them except somebody complains and that's when everybody comes out so and, let's and, keep yeah. let's keep the complaints and the other little whatever people do during campaigns let's keep that from happening so that we can all have a clean campaign and move forward in a positive manner i think lompoc needs that positive uh, outlook especially mm -hmm. for campaigns and, and sorry to interrupt but because council member mosby brought it up library so are you looking for flexibility for for um, the banner or yard signs or are you, do you have a preference yeah they they have a little structure there I um, probably should look at that and and some of the others that are out there okay. um, right. you know I think one of the other items that's conflicting a little bit with the temporary signs is you know the banners about not being freestanding because there are people putting up banners freestanding with with stakes um, so maybe a clarification on the definition of a banner well, whether they're you know is bring it up for discussion and see what they say I mean, does it make a difference if a banner has a couple stakes in the ground or if it's attached to a fence or to a building and what is the public I mean we're supposed to be here to benefit the public what is the public what are they doing right now um, there's quite a bit of that that is happening um, so maybe you know, feel it out and see what's going on. Uh, I'm not, I, I agree with uh, Council Member Vega that the, the sign aspect, this wasn't really enforced last time. And for the record, I don't have signs. I trim mine down to 12 square feet, so. I noticed yours you are know. smaller. <laughs> yeah, well, they were yeah. four by four to begin with, trimmed them down, it's all right. But the other aspect for years, and you'll see that there's a lot of other people who are running who have four by eights. Um, that are using four by eights in other jurisdictions and you don't see them here, but I know they're out there. Uh, so a lot of the candidates do this, but it's, you know, it's not, I'm not, I'm, I'm focusing more towards the, what we have out there. Okay. Um, but yeah, Mission of the Library, I think that would be a good one. And there are a couple nonprofits around that are also have signposts up that are, that are attaching temporary signs to them. And, and see what we can work. See if they're the blight component that everybody thinks they were to be. I don't, I don't think they are. Okay. Yeah, we can bring this back uh, to the Planning Commission on the 14th, add the sign component. It, it, and I have one other, I mean, a little, the exemption aspect that's out there, you know, this, so the census banners and, and signs that are all over the place. And then of course we have the COVID. So there's certain aspects it seems 
I don't think anybody pulled a permit for any of the census sign, banners, yard sign, whatever they were wanting to be called that were, were put up and tied up around, did they? And they're definitely up longer than 30 days. Not that I'm aware of. I think a lot of those signs are pretty small, but the, I'd have to check on the uh, larger there's ones. There's some big ones, the ones hanging with one arm and stuff coming into town and such. I mean, I think that's part of the blight aspect they were, but they're, they seem to be exempted because they're government signs. Um, but maybe we want to tune things up so they mate and match uh, a little bit. And I'm not sure if the census sign falls under the exemption, does it, city attorney? Uh, I mean, I don't know who exactly put that up, but there is an exemption in our code right now for any sign that's placed by the city, county, or a federal or state government agency in carrying out its responsibility to protect public health, safety, and welfare. So that probably includes those census signs, and so they'd be exempt from our sign ordinance. And I just think we've got to be careful about a slippery slope component again when, you know, little Orwellian when government good and private sector bad. Council Member Cordova. Um, Brian, what is the fee for uh, that yard sign once it goes past that? So it's a, it's a temporary sign and it's, it is in our fee schedule. It's $105, but I've been trying to be very flexible and we're not charging per location like the mayor mentioned tonight. So the 105 is as many as you want to put up because in the permit we're asking um, for those signs to be removed after the election and we're just allowing as long as we document them get permission from the property owner we're not charging 105 for each per, uh, sign location so again it, it just a um 105 dollars to me is not an astronomical fee i get that everybody has different um you know different pockets i understand that respectfully um i have no problem paying my city of Lompoc my $105 fee to put up a sign, but I am appalled by the fact that we continue to discuss this in political si as political signs when clearly the city attorney has already stated and clarified for us that the Supreme Court has made it um, illegal for us to designate the differences on these signs, and yet this is exactly what my problem is, is that we continue to want to skirt around policy and order in this city and that was what i was pointing out to even with the general plan on the on the consent calendar issue why that is the case to benefit us in this in this situation i strongly disagree council member vega you know brian i'd like to give a little more clear direction uh, councilman mosey said let's go back and see whatever they say but how about here if we go to the large signs and we limit them to 32 square feet and we go back with that direction to planning commission okay and leave everything else you know pretty much the same uh, for that I mean how does that fit under your guidelines the large that, signs. that's fine we'll take that direction uh, 8 by 4 32 square feet I would probably want to carry that over to the banner because right now the banner says 30 square feet and might as well just make the banner 32 as well yeah if we could do that I think that's a little bit easier you know and that way we have a, a different standard obviously we're doing some cleanup as you said so there's nothing here that we can't negotiate out or, or talk about that's what we're here for um, I don't think you want to spend all your time on these political signs either, okay? I'm sure you're busier than that, so let's find a, something that we can meet in the middle here and, and take it to Planning Commission, and, and let's go from here and see what happens. Understood. And, and just a clarification, Councilmember Cordova, so this is going to apply to, to all temporary signs, so even though it has been brought up as a, a political sign, it, it's good. I brought these examples because these are all temporary signs. We're not going to call out political in the sign code, it's just going to fall under a temporary sign. So all these examples that I've given, um, they're, they're just going to fall under that category. So I understand what you're saying, but I um, want to just clarify that we're not just talking about political signs, but a whole yeah. gamut um, of signs. Yeah. Can I respond? Under and, that category. Oh, and thank you for clarifying. And Mr. Malawi, obviously things have changed. Uh, political signs weren't illegal before, and they weren't taboo, and you could talk about them because they are a, a, a fact of life is during campaigns. So the city is gonna to have to make a stance also. Uh, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna promote or, or, or are we 
going to just be clear here because here we're, we're just doing a cleanup. And I don't think there's anything illegal about asking for a cleanup on something that may have slipped by some people. And some people that are out there in the public, um, they're not even aware of it, but we'd like to encourage other people to run for office and at the time, the next time, have it a little bit more clear. Councilmember Cordova. Um, Brian, I do appreciate you clarifying that, and, and I 100% am okay with bringing back changes and discussing them. Um, and actually, it's not staff, it's, it's our council that continues to reference political signs when we've already been told that we can't do that. So yes, I completely understand your point, and I'm okay with um, bringing back the discussion. However, um, I know we're talking like it's a done deal, but we haven't even taken public comment. For clarification from our city attorney, um, public comment isn't noted on our agenda, but given the nature of this, I'm seeing a head nod of we should- We, we should see if there's any We should any take public some comment. public comment, thank you. All right, if there's no other questions um, for staff, we will move to public comment. The number to call is 805-875-8201. Remember to mute your TV, PC, or radio when you call in and your call is put through. You will have three minutes, 805-875-8201. And the item is number five, temporary signs and changes made to it. Mayor, for clarification, yes. I did notice that the public comment was not on the agenda that okay. you received, but then I made the change when I got back to the office on Great. Monday. It was posted to the, Thank you. the agenda on the website. Thank you. You're welcome. I must have printed mine out after. I mean before. Hello, you're live in the Lompoc City Council meeting. You have three minutes to provide public comment. Thank you very much. My name is Janet Blevins. I have a question about the legality of posting a campaign banner on city property, which would be the fence around the city airport. I do not understand how that can possibly be legal since that is city-owned property. At least it is my understanding that it is city-owned taxpayer property. Is that so I, I need that to be clarified. I know this, the council cannot answer a question right now, but that is something that I would need clarified. Eight zero five. 875-8201. Remember to mute your TV, PC, or radio when your call is put through. Hello, you're live in the Lompoc City Council meeting. You have three minutes to provide public comment. Hello, my name is Nicholas Gonzalez, and I would recommend that you may want to consider adding a 90-day limitation uh, to the 32 square foot for both the billboard yard sign and the banner. Um, that would possibly help to prevent uh, signs from being around the, on a permanent basis rather than on a, a temporary basis. And um, recollecting the previous statement that was just made. Um, I believe that issue was taken up before uh, during the campaign of Bob Lingle, in which case uh, there was a leaseor and the leaseor had a certain right. And so the uh, sign was placed by the leaseor. Uh, that's just some feedback that I recall as a, as a former planning commission, but laws may have changed and that would be probably most appropriate for the attorney to address. Um, that being said, I think using a standard size of 32 square feet limitation works um, because that is a standard material that is easily available to work with. And also putting the 90 days would limit the time, thereby preventing any uh, extended blight. Thank you.
The number to call is 805-875-8201. And remember to mute your TV, PC, or radio when your call is put through, 805-875-8201. Madam Clerk, were there any written comments? No, ma'am. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. 805-875-8201, 805-875-8201. And remember to mute your TV, PC, or radio when your call is put through. Actually, we did get a email on item five. Yes, Mr. Fink sent in. It's all right. I just I was recalling it, so I just wanted to clarify for the record. Seeing no one else call in, we will close public comment and bring it back to council for discussion and direction for staff. Any additional instruction to staff from what came before? Councilmember Mosby. I think staff, where are you? There you are. I think staff has heard some of the suggestions we had and, and I think that we should make the motion to take this um, back to the Planning Commission to continue discussion on the temporary sign component and some of the items that we said. Looking at some of the, in, as my recommendation, some of the items that are out there there was the recommendation for the four by eight sheet, um, but you know, go around and look, take some measurements and stuff of what people are using. I think even Explore Lompoc has some signs that are out there on four by eight sheets as well, advertising and promoting events and such on both entrances to town. So I think there's items that are out there that we need to tune up. If they are a blight item, then adjust accordingly. But if it seems like to be working with, um, you know, put it together. I know it's a long. Uh, suggestion to go forward with but I think that's in a nutshell of what we've been discussing so I would say take it back to the Planning Commission with some of the comments and recommendations that we made here council member Cordova um, I just want to say that is false explore Lompoc does not have any signs um, that are posted at the entrances of town that I am aware of um, so no, we don't. And um, I'd like to also include maybe the 90-day limitation um, recommendation that was brought forth if this is something that moves forward. I think that should be considered as well. Councilmember Vega. Um, yes, and uh, I'd like to give a second to that and also take a look at the, the lot sizes from which those banners, if we get them included, because I think that it says an acre, and I think we can do better than that. And also just to uh, respond, uh, any city signs that we have out there on the airport area were actually by permission from the city manager. So for the public, just to let you know there's nothing illegal out there. Because yes, you do have to go through the city and we did go through the process with this permit process. Uh, Councilmember Mosby, are you okay with the additional comments made on the motion? Okay. Um, it's been moved and, and seconded. Um, I think it's really important that until these things are adopted and changed that we double check the signs, their locations and the acreage and make sure that we're at least following the current rules that are in place and make sure we're not violating those. And I would ask our city attorney after we vote to give a clarification on the airport property. Council member, I mean, city clerk. Um, I, I know council member Vega, you said something about the acreage. Do you want staff to review or bring back lower amount, uh, smaller lots that yes, are available? Yes, ma'am. How small? Um, uh, that, we'll leave that up for discussion right now. I don't have a set lot size. All right, let's vote. 
That passes 5-0. Mr. Malone. And yes, thank you, Mayor. On the airport signs issue, there are, it is city-owned property, but there are also tenants on the city-owned property who are renting space from the city. And uh, much like if it were city-owned or government-owned housing, uh, just because it's city-owned property, that does not take away their right to place political signs on the property that they are renting. Um, so under their lease, there is a provision for the lessee to um, apply to the city for permission to put up a sign. And under the First Amendment, uh, we will not deny that permission to put up the sign. So that's why they are there. And uh, it is not a violation of any law or um, uh, uh, ethical issue of any kind. As long as it's not actually fencing that surrounds the airport proper, but is actually the fencing belonging to the leasee on their portion of the lease property. It would need to be within the premises that are leased by the lessor, yes, uh, the lessee. Okay, thank you for that clarification. There are no staff presentation announcements or requests. We will open the floor for general oral communication on city matters. You may call in and have three minutes to speak on city issues that are not on the agenda at 805-875-8201. 805-875-8201. Remember to mute your TV, PC, or radio when your call is put through. 805-875-8201. Good evening, you're live in the Lompoc City Council meeting. You have three minutes to provide public comment. Okay. When do I go on there? Go ahead, please. Yeah, well, they're talking. On, I've watched them talk too. Do I? You record and then send it in. Is that it? Hello. Excuse me, sir. You're live. Can you go ahead and turn your TV off in the background? Oh, yeah. Okay. Can you turn the TV off, Bonnie? What? Yeah, I'll try to get it turned off. Turn the TV off. I'm sorry about that. I need to be shut off. Okay, I'm sorry. Hello? Hello. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Yeah, I, if I'm talking to the council. This is Dwayne Holmdahl. Uh, the reason I'm calling is on this so you're talking on Phoenix Business is proposed status with LLC. Magalie the Canyon. You're going to have that coming down. I, I'm not talking about it, what you took, but the consideration is that you're going to make sure they take care of the flood control process because they're going to go all the way to back in and then when we get some major rain to Magalie the Canyon, we get some flooding. And the people who are bordering the border between the county and the city as it gets into town will get hit by all. There's all kinds of trees in the creek that have not been cut down or trimmed or pruned. Well, some of the owners are doing that, but I think the city better pay attention to what it's going to do to itself. Did that go through? Thank you. Did that make it? Yes, your comment was received. Oh, okay. So that's all I want to do is let them know what I saw on that, and they should take a look at that canyon. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any written communications for general oral communications? Yes, ma'am. Uh, also from Ron Frank, he emailed something that was delivered to council staff and posted to the website. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, you're live at the Lompoc City Council meeting. Go ahead and provide public, public comment. You have three minutes. Hi, good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. My name is Gabriel Garcia, and I'm calling just to recognize the City of Lompoc employees and the EDA for providing a generous donation to the family of a uh, longtime city employee that recently passed, Jeanette Bartels. And uh, the EDA, which is the Employee Development Association, spearheaded this campaign to provide the donation, which was delivered to um, Ms. Bartels or Mrs. Bartels' family today. 
and they were really touched by the generosity of, of our city employees. So I just wanted to go ahead and, and uh, say thank you to everyone that donated and a big thank you to the EDA. Thank you. Good evening. You're live in the Lompoc City Council meeting. You have three minutes to provide public comment. Hi, my name is Sean Del Malcolm, and I want to talk about the uh, the body worn cameras again that we had the presentation for last week with uh, the police chief. Um, first, I wanted to talk about the org chart that Lompoc has. At the top of the org chart, it has the citizens of Lompoc. Um, many times at the city, city council meetings, I think that that org chart is flipped upside down and the citizens of Lompoc are looked at as the bottom. Um, I'm saying that because we had a conversation in the city chambers about these body-worn cameras back in June. And now we're being told that we need to wait until December for the police chief to come back with some more numbers, which means that the, the body cameras are not going to be um, even discuss or fund it until 2021. So looking at the proposal that Chief Mariani um, presented, um, the first mistake I found is that um, the amount of money that he's requesting for the five-year program, he had it at $517,626.93. Um, when you add up the numbers, that actually only comes out to four thousand thirty-one dollars. Sorry, four thousand. Sorry, four hundred thirty-one thousand six hundred six dollars and thirty-two cents. So it's overstated by um, a little over eighty-six thousand um, dollars. Again, I'm not understanding why we are not funding this. We have three positions that for $300,000 that the police chief has already said he knows he's not going to fill. So we have the money in the budget already. The first year is only $115,000 to buy this equipment. We should be able then to fund the rest of it. And we can fund it with those three positions. We can take those three positions and reallocate that money which is not at the discretion of the police chief, that is actually at the discretion of the city. And we can reallocate that money and we can purchase those, those uh, body-worn cameras. The following year, we can give two positions back and only claim one of those positions and we can continue to fund these body-worn cameras. I'm asking the city council to put this back on the agenda so that this can be voted on and that we can have these body worn cameras purchased immediately and put in use. Thank you. Good evening. You're live in the Lompoc City Council meeting. You have three minutes to provide public comment. I'd like to comment on the traffic. Um, I currently live over on 7th street and on july 21st i sat in my front yard and i counted the number of cars that went down 7th street there were 284 cars from 315 to 345 and i guarantee you they're not all doing 30 miles an hour it's a race raceway through here and i want to know if there's going to be anything you know that can be done about it Is that all, ma'am? I beg your pardon? Oh, is your public comment complete? Yes. Thank you. Good evening. You're live in the Lompoc City Council meeting. You have three minutes to provide public comment. Thank you. My name is Nicholas Gonzalez. 
I'd like to expand a little bit on the statements that were just made um, by Malcolm. Uh, in the past budget uh, cycles, um, it was shown in the CAFA report that the police department did not utilize all the funding that was allocated. Uh, so I would like the council to entertain uh, CAFA revision during this budget cycle to see if there's going to be unexpended funds and, and those funds possibly could be reallocated to uh, the camera program. Um, I, I believe that that might be possible with those unfilled positions, and I would have to concur um, that funds that are not utilized because they are not able to promptly hire um, should be able to be used for that. And you've resolved the the pension dilemma, so I would also like to see what the savings were um, as the result of recasting the pension. And that should also free up money that otherwise would have been used to pay for debt service uh, to be able to apply to other areas in the general fund. So those are two very viable sources of, of funding that could address the cameras. And I would like the council to take them into consideration. Thank you. Good evening. You're live in the Lompoc City Council meeting. You have three minutes to provide public comment. Good evening. This is Daryl Tullis. I'm a longtime Lompoc resident. I have a couple of comments. First of all, on the listing on the television, it didn't say, it doesn't say city council meeting tonight. So I wasn't even sure that you were having a meeting. Um, and the other thing is that uh, two things. One, we've talked about the weekend, um, the weekend market that was uh, here in Lompo for 25 years that got that got canceled, and you guys had a vote just a couple of weeks ago about possibly bringing it back. And once again, excuses were brought up as to why we couldn't bring it back. And you want to wait until we can find a place for it. You know, the amount of time that, that it's been shut down, I can't understand why you haven't been able to find another place for it. So to me, it's just another excuse for uh, postponing it. And I think it's one of those kind of things where you're waiting until after this election. And, you know, I just want to make a comment about the fact that the person who brought that to the council to have it, closed down. Once again, I've mentioned to the, uh, the fact that I used to work for this person or with this person on the base uh, who lived in the house right across the street from the market in the gray house on the corner. And um, I just want everyone to know in this city that a comment that he made to me the day after we tried that we actually got it extended. The comment that he made to me at work was that it was a Mexican market and that there is no place in the state of or in the country of in the, in the United States where there should be a Mexican market. And that's the real reason why he pushed to have it shut down. And so for those of you who are on the city council, hearing that, uh, and yes, the, the vendors there were predominantly Latinos. And for him to be able to say that and for him to be able to get that thing shut down and we have two Latinos on the city council and we know we have a mayor who also voted to have it uh, brought back and we still don't have that brought back. And for the other gentlemen on the on the council, you know, a lot of your clients throughout the years have been Latinos. So let's stop playing that game. And let's start f and find a way to bring that market back. And lastly, uh, we need to have a forum with our police department, with our police chief, and with our mayor. And, 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 and I know you can't have a quorum, but we need to have a discussion about how the community and the police department are going to relate to each other better. I don't think we have a big problem in this, in this city as far as how we relate to our police department. But before it becomes one, we need our police uh, force better. And I think you'll find that if we had that forum 
and we all got to know the police force better, I think we'd have better relations with the police force. Because I know as a black man growing, uh, living here in Lompoc for over, for almost 20 years now. Time is, is, is past. Okay, well, I just don't see it running on my, on, my, on my screen. So I apologize for that. But if you look, I'm, I'm looking at the television right now, and I don't see the clock running. So. Apologies, I, I think we forgot to set the time that time. But I can see it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. Okay, so believe me, next time I will not go over my time if I can see my time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the number to call is 805-875-8201. 805-875-8201. Council meeting, you have three minutes to provide public comment. Hi, thank you. Hi, my, my name is Aaron Gibson. Um, I'm calling to speak about item number seven on the agenda. <clears throat> um, as a, a lifetime Lompoc resident and citizen taxpayer, um, I'm appalled uh, that Strauss Wind is proposing this item as a community benefit agreement, quote unquote. Um, on what community is benefiting? We won't see any of the energy or cost saving associated with it. <clears throat> With it being, uh, it's a county jurisdiction, uh, we won't see any property or tax benefits either. Also, there's going to be a lot of work associated with a project like this. We need to see that local hire is a top priority, and <clears throat> as well as the use of a skilled and, and trained workforce through, the, uh, through an accredited apprenticeship workshop, uh, apprenticeship workshop program um, out there. There's, there's carpenters, there's an IBW with the electricians, there's the cement masons, there's the operators, and so on and so forth. Um, at a minimum, we should see that the wages earned on this project get spent locally and that the men, women, and veterans, and everyone in between earn an area standard wage and benefits. Everyone involved seems to benefit but the entity who they wish to provide the path of travel. We need to re review this further and get an offer that actually benefits the community and people who live here. Thank you for your time. Good evening. You're live in the Lompoc City Council meeting. You have three minutes to provide public comment. Hello, I'm Tyler Chagoya. As a long, long time Lompoc resident, all I see with this project, uh, on item number seven, the Winstross Energy Project. We get a quick, uh, it doesn't provide any benefits for us. We get a quick payment one time that equals insufficient fraction of what the county will get annually over the 30 years. We were left out of the initial project discussions by not having a seat at the table, and yet discussions are being made that impact me, my family, and my community. Um, I feel the personally disrespected at how outside entities and companies like Strauss Wind look at Lompoc with today and as if we don't don't even matter. A real community benefit agreement would bring forth the benefit from this annually and also have a guarantee that our local residents have priority local hire. Thank you. The number to call is 805-875-8201, 805-875-8201. And remember to mute your TV, PC, or radio when you call in. Seeing no additional calls, we'll go ahead and close oral communication and bring it back to the agenda. Um, item number six is appointments. We have an open position on the Beautification Commission. That is Councilmember Cordova's appointment. The position is through uh, December 2020, and there is one application, Juliana Ibarra, Councilmember Cordova. 
Um, I would like to request that Ms. Ibarra be accepted as the uh, beautification commissioner in representation of myself. I'll give you a second. Any other questions or concerns? Seeing none, let's vote. And that is 5-0 in favor. Welcome aboard, Ms. Ibarra. Item number seven, unfinished business. Consideration of the community benefit agreement proposed by Strauss Wind LLC in connection with the 100 megawatt wind energy project to be located on private land southwest of the city. We have our city attorney, Mr. Malave, to make the presentation. Thank you, Mayor. We're here tonight on this item again, uh, which we were last here on June 16th to discuss the community benefit agreement that is being proposed by Strauss Wind uh, that is related to their development of an approximately 100 megawatt wind energy project to be located on private land southwest of the city outside city limits. Uh, this project requires various approvals by several different um, government agencies at all levels, but what it requires from the city of Lompoc is essentially permits to travel through the city and to transport its large equipment um, through the city on city streets. Um, it requires from the city of Lompoc an encroachment permit uh, in order to travel over our city streets, a oversized vehicle permit to take oversized vehicles, because this is very large equipment um, over our city streets, and an agreement that's required by the EIR for the project uh, that was approved by the county, uh, an agreement to repair and compensate the city for any damage or wear and tear on the city's streets and city infrastructure. So on the last time we were here on this item on June 2nd, Strauss was proposing an agreement where they would pay to the city a $150,000 payment one time that would be in addition to all of the conditions and compensation that, that the city would require of them as a condition of their city permits. Repairing the streets, um, repairing the wear and tear on the streets, repairing any damage to the streets, all of the city's costs of processing their applications, the 150000 that they were proposing would be in addition to all of that. Um, but the catch last time was that that $150,000 would only be paid if the construction on the project commenced by June fifteenth, 2020. Um, and only if the project was fully constructed and able to sell electricity by December 31st, 2021. And we would only receive the payment when the project was fully constructed and able to sell electricity. Um, we proposed, at, uh, staff proposed at that June 16th meeting that certain changes could be made to the agreement. One of which is that the payment should be made when the, uh, when the applicant starts transporting equipment on city streets and not when the project is fully and completely developed. Um, another suggestion that staff had was that uh, the city would reserve the right to oppose or file lawsuits to challenge the approvals for the project that were approved by other government agencies and they were asking us to waive that right before. Um, Staff suggested that the provision for mandatory binding arbitration be removed from the agreement. That essentially means that if we were, if we needed to try to enforce this agreement because there was a breach, we, the city would want to be able to go to court to do that and not go to a private arbitrator. And then staff suggested that the amount of the community benefit agreement would be, uh, or should be, increased to $1 million. The council took those into account and um, provided some comments to Strauss and, also, and then directed staff to continue negotiating on this community benefit agreement with Strauss. So we did do that between June 16th and now. <coughs> between June 16th and now. And what we 
have come back with is described on pages two to three of the staff report in four short bullet points. And they have um, sufficiently agreed to a number of the things that we were asking them for in our negotiations, uh, sufficiently in staff's point of view. Um, items two, three, and four here, staff really doesn't have an issue with, and um, it seems to be that what's left to the council and to Strauss um, to discuss and what staff has attempted to discuss is the amount of the community benefit payment. So let me just describe where we've left off here with our negotiations with Strauss. Strauss has now agreed to pay a total of $250,000 instead of the 150 that was before. Uh, and this is gonna be in three different installments. So the first installment would be um, right after this agreement is executed. So right after we sign the agreement, uh, the city would receive the first $100,000. The second $100,000 would be paid to the city five business days after the first uh, transportation of wind turbine equipment over a city street. And then the final $50,000 would be paid after the project construction is completed and the project is able to start producing electricity for sale. So that's item number one. Item number two is that Strauss has agreed to allow the city to reserve its right to file lawsuits to challenge the approvals of the project by other government agencies um, as long as they are modifications of the original approvals that would affect the city in a way um, that could not have been known at the time that the approvals were approved. And so I think, in my opinion, that makes sense. Um, that if their permits from other agencies are modified in some way that impacts the city, that we had no idea that they would uh, have applied for that modification, we will be able to exercise our rights in court to challenge those modifications of their permits from other agencies. Uh, Strauss did agree to remove mandatory binding arbitration from the agreement, so if we need to enforce the agreement, we will be able to go to court, and we will also be able to recover any of our attorney's fees that we spend in trying to enforce the terms of the agreement in court. Um, and then finally, number four, at the end of the staff report, is... Um, it's essentially the same as it was before that uh, we are, uh, in our encroachment permits, we will be able to require Strauss to compensate the city for any impacts, damage, wear and tear on city streets, any impacts to city uh, traffic, any impacts and damage to sidewalks, to city landscaping, and any other city infrastructure that is caused by the project and we will be able to require Strauss to compensate the city for all of the staff costs, attorney's costs, contractor costs, and consultant costs that the city incurs in processing its encroachment and other city permits. Um, but um, anything over and above all of those impacts is going to be deemed mitigated by the $250,000 payment under this community benefit agreement. So uh, staff does not have an issue with numbers two, three, and four. Uh, we think those are acceptable. Um, there is the issue of number one, left to negotiate. Uh, so what we're looking for tonight is uh, the, the applicant is here and he can give a presentation and provide any input to the council that he wishes. But uh, we're looking tonight for the council to review these revisions to the agreement and let us know if they are acceptable or if you would like to direct staff to um, further negotiate with Strauss. And you can also provide any comments that you wish to provide to Strauss tonight as well. So that is the staff report and I'm available for questions. Mayor, if I may just yes. add one more quick thing. During the last meeting the city attorney and I had with um, Strauss and their representatives, was a suggestion that they reach out to the county 
the number I had heard was about $40 million over the life of the project for property tax. And to see if they can discuss with the county um, to have some kind of contribution to the city as an ongoing amount, given that we will be, <clears throat> excuse me, the first responders for both police and fire, you know, once the project's up and running until it, it's completely over 30 years from now. Um, part of that was being that, as we all know, the current, rep, you know, relationship between the city and county is such that I personally thought it's best that they reach out since they'll be the people making the payments to the county, they can bring that up. So during the discussion, they had said, yes, they, if I'm correct, they were going to be um, reaching out to the county in order to attempt to get that for the city. So that would be an ongoing payment um, of a dollar amount. I don't know that at this moment. Um, before we invite the uh, representative from Strauss up, any questions for Mr. Malave? Council Member Vega. Uh, Mr. Malave, one of the key issues here was first responders and how that works. It doesn't seem like we've referenced that. Uh, asking the county to contribute or do something, I think that there's a, uh, it'd be nice to get a response to that on who's gonna pay for it and how that's gonna work. Yeah, I apologize. I did forget to mention that aspect of this. The, uh, the city likely will be the first responder if there is any emergency down at the project, just because we're the closest um, services to the project. And this $250,000 in this community benefit agreement is intended, at least intended by the applicant, to cover those first responder costs uh, for over the life of the project. Um, as well as any other costs and impacts on the city that are not impacts to streets, traffic, sidewalks, landscaping, city infrastructure, and all the city's staff costs for processing the project. The, the, the 250000 is intended to cover everything other than those impacts. You know, it seems to me that that would come out a little bit short uh, for the longevity of the project. Uh, it'd be nice to have a little bit more of a commitment from Strauss uh, as far as for a year to year what the benefit would be because it seems like it's a little short. It seems like if it was $50,000 a year for a certain amount of year for first responders, it might be a little bit more uh, viable for us because we don't want to come out on the short end here, especially with our budget, with COVID. Um, sometimes there's staff shortages. Sometimes there's people that are out sick. So we need to make sure that uh, we support our first responders here on this aspect, because I don't think the city's in a position here to go into a negative round on the revenue stream uh, for response. Um, we're all thinking it's a brand new project and it's all gonna run flawlessly, but we don't know what's gonna happen here. So I think that's something we should reference uh, before we even come to uh, the table here to say we're agreeing. We, I agree, okay, you, you've agreed to two, three, and four, but number one is still a big issue. Any other questions? Councilmember Cordova. Um, <clears throat> City Attorney, just before coming into the meeting, I, I got a comment from a local resident that um, I was not aware of, and I uh, had I been aware of it before, I would have maybe asked this question sooner, but I feel compelled to ask it now because I do think it's quite important to, to ask it. And then that way, since we have the applicant present, we can always um, address that too and put that to rest. Um, it is my understanding, and this again is from the resident comment that was made to me, that there was um, huge graded areas that were performed in this area, as well as maybe a road near um, 7th Street that was built. Um, whether it connects into our city limits or doesn't connect into our city limits, I'm not sure. I don't know, so maybe our public works can maybe um, comment on that. Um, but whether there was, um, I guess, mitigate, mitigation or consideration for any potential in the event of El Nino years or something like that, for any potential runoff of water that would create any particular canals that would come directly or flow directly into the city of Lompoc. I feel compelled to ask that question and to maybe provide some answers both from our um, you know, applicant as well as from our public works if that is in fact something that happened or if that's an issue that we foresee in the future for our Lompoc residents. We can, uh, I was gonna say, we can ask, I don't know if Public Works has any 
I would have to mm -hmm. defer to Public Works on whether that road was constructed, whether there's any mitigation for it. The, the road you're talking about was an existing um, access road for the power lines that are back there. Okay, thank you. Seeing no additional questions for our attorney, I will invite Mr. McCormick to the microphone if he would like to present or answer questions. Councilman, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, first of all, I, I want to thank um, Mr. Troop and Mr. Malloway for uh, the last 18 weeks we've been working on this uh, benefit agreement and uh, along with Craig and his group and uh, I think we're at, we've presented everything we needed to uh, present and I'm here to answer any questions. So have you begun discussions with the county about how they might um, share in the property tax that um, we are looking at hopefully benefiting in some way with? Yeah, I'll, let, me, let me submit a couple documents here. First, I'd like to submit the response to the fire of first respondents. Uh, I reached out to directly to the county, and the, uh, the county has sent me back this email. I didn't get it till late this afternoon. But in summary, the city of Lompoc would be reimbursed for any cost associated with wildfire suppression on the state. This is, Seminole County is under state, so under the Fire Prevention Act, all that money would be reimbursable to the city. So, that means, so there is no cost to the Lompoc uh, for fire. I reached out. We went right to the property uh, assessor's office, and of the money that's, that's set aside for property taxes, there are nearly $18 million that go to Lompoc. Uh, $16.5 million go to schools. A million dollars goes to the hospital, and almost $400,000 goes to uh, the graveyard facility. So those are all uh, property tax issues uh, that I reached out to directly from the assessor's office. So there is property taxes that are, that are sent to Lompoc and almost $18 million over the life of the project. Any other questions for Mr. McCormick? Councilmember Cordova. Um, not really for Mr. McCormick, but I guess for our city manager, city attorney, or public works division, um, or even our finance, uh, whoever has these answers. Um, if, if and when there is a fire in Miguelito Canyon and it falls in the Santa Barbara County um, area, um, does the city submit for reimbursement when we are uh, responding to fires in that area? Yes, we'll get reimbursement, just like if we were going up north to the current fires. Um, but if it's not a wildfire situation, that it's just a car fire, it's a man down, whatever, then that's not um, being reimbursed. Okay, and then um, with regards to the statement that uh, Mr. McCormick just made right now about the, over the life of, of what they're assuming of the project would be, the figures that were just thrown at council, is that something that we confirm as being actual, that there is uh, revenue that comes in in those uh, categories or those elements? And those, those different ones, the school district, cemetery district, hospital, those would be something that they would collect some property tax, but it doesn't come to the city. It goes to those different entities that are not part of the city. Right. So that's the difference is, is that yeah. it doesn't come into the city as a yeah. general fund. It comes into those particular entities. And so I think there's clarification that was needed there. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilman Rega. You know, it's, it seems that the, uh, the emergency response, uh, like you were stating, just the short-term medical responses, the fires, you know, that's not going to be reimbursed. I, is there an issue with that? Uh, because of a mutual aid agreement, is that correct? Yeah, we, we have the mutual aid for both police and fire. So if it's a non, you know, wildfire situation, then we would 
be responding because we do have mutual aid. So why why would we not be negotiating that out right now in the beginning instead of, you know, um, accepting like that with not no compensation? Uh, in the beginning, when I had these conversations with all of us, we said this is an ongoing project. Which, uh, hey, I wish it well, uh, but we thought about there's cost long term here that aren't being referenced. It looks like we're reaching out for a quick. Uh, and I'm reaching out to whom? I'm reaching out to whom? I'm not sure. Uh, it looks like we are, you know, we, we're okay with two, three, and four, and number one is, mm -hmm. is being proposed uh, that we accept it or we provide direction, other direction. My only issue is right here is with the public safety aspect of it. Regardless if it's a short-term response, it's still time spent. Correct. I think there's value to that, and we should put value on that. Correct. So that, that's kind of my, well, my point. Serve and you know I'm saying we should put value based on the mutual aid. The reimbursement takes staff time. It takes other other time for the county to reimburse. Also, I don't think it just happens automatically, does it? No, we'd have to. We'd be supplying all of the documentation for the firefighters. If if it was a for in like a wildfire situation, if it's like I said, a, a person down, some structure fire, that's not a reimbursable we'd be the first ones to be out there, um, both police and fire, because of our location to the proximity to it. I just think this is our time to cross our T's and dot our I's as far as for the responders and the first response, sir. Thank you. Council Member Snowrat. Yeah, Mr. Troop, just a, a quick question. When we were negotiating with the county for Summit View, ridiculous, the, the project got taken advantage of, the city doesn't receive its full reimbursement on property tax. We've assumed all the responsibilities and the reward was taken. Why don't we do the reverse on this with the county? Do the same thing. I would, but they hold all the cards at this point. There's, they're the ones that keep the, you know, collect the tax and keep the tax. So there's not a way for us to force that to come over to us. We don't have to. I'm saying, you know, this project where 7th Street ends, that road, I'm glad I don't have a house that backs up to it. And that, yeah. that road has not been used in years. Now it's used. I had a lady that called earlier about the traffic. I'm sure she was probably complaining about the amount of traffic that goes up there. Yeah. I mean, we're not talking little Toyota trucks. We're talking water trucks. We're talking trailers, dozers. Yeah. It's... No, there's that. The mitigation we, is going to go away, our, or, you know, not go away with that. Yeah, or during our different discussions, you know, there's a qualitative and quantitative cost to the city, and that, that's a qualitative cost. So. Yeah, I mean, that does not include I Street or Ocean, nothing. That's just 7th Street. Mr. McCormick, for clarity, how many permanent jobs will exist after build out is finished uh, locally? In the O&M facility, there will be roughly six permanent jobs. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Cordova. Um, and Mr. McCormick, I know one of the biggest things that the public has mentioned is um, when we call this a community benefit agreement, um, can you talk to us a little bit about, aside from this, because I think where, where our residents feel this is community benefit. I mean, they're not seeing the benefit in it, you know. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, what your project has brought so far to this community or what you anticipate that it's going to bring with regards to whether it's um, economic development or I think in the last meeting you said something about you guys have rented storefront uh, building that was empty. Talk to us about that. So if I may, I want to submit... Uh... Here's a, a list of over a hundred local businesses that we that we patronage as of right now. So there's a list of over a hundred businesses that we spend money at currently have in the past. Uh, to give you some idea, we have spent almost eighty-three thousand dollars on travel and hotel expenses all within the city of Lompoc. This is only Baywa I'm speaking for. We, are, we have spent more than $27,000 in meals in the city of, of Lompoc. Our environmental consultants team between hotels and meals 
have spent an additional $170,000 that have all gone to the local com uh, uh, community. There are different contractors and different uh, processes along the, uh, the project itself. Uh, I would like to point out that the, all the security for the project is all um, contracted with a local contractor here in Lompoc. Uh, in addition to all the hotels, uh, there's been printing, fuel, all these expenses have all been uh, here directly in the city of Lompoc, in addition to rentals such as Sunbelt and these other agencies all within the city of Lompoc. All of the foundations, the, all the concrete, all that stuff there is all coming from the city of Lompoc. In addition to all the foundation fuels, uh, all our vehicles and so forth for doing all that work is all funded, all, all that money is spent within the city of Lompoc. We have hired local residences that work directly for Baywa. Our subcontractors have hired local residents that work, that work for them as well. I do want to uh, point out that one of the largest contractors that we do is the electrical portion. That work is all being done by a local electric company here in Lompoc. Not outside agencies, no one else bought in. These are all local businesses here. Uh, fencing companies that have all done all the barbed wire, all that stuff, all local businesses. All the fuel, uh, rental offices and stuff that'll be all in construction, those are all local businesses that all gain from this. So there's been a lot of impact, a lot of financial impact to the city of Lompoc. A lot of money has been spent and a lot of money has been, been distributed in the community. And when you say local, um, are you specifically referring to companies inside of Lompoc, not local to just the area or the region, but specifically when you say local electrical company or local security company that is providing services to your site, um, are they local as in of Lompoc? Yes, in the city of Lompoc. And then um, to specifically discuss the whole labor um, portion of it, and I know there was a caller earlier today, um, and I know that I've received comments on this, on this also. Um, aside from these companies, I know that there's some local um, unions and local, you know, trades trade work uh, that is interested. And so do you guys have at least a policy or something that states first local to Lompoc, if we can't find it in Lompoc, then we go outside of Lompoc to the region or to the area before you bring in somebody from out of state or out of even the, the compounds of Santa Barbara County. So I just want to point out that these, these types of jobs are very specific. They take highly trained individuals. There are not a whole lot of wind turbine trains technician living in the city of Lompoc and they exist so far. However, like I said, all electricians, those people are all a local company right here using all their own stuff. They have their own tradesmen, their own apprentices. Those programs are all out there. Uh, the, uh, the high uh, voltage lines, that's all done by union. So they will go out to all the union labors that's available in the county. Again, due to the fact that these are technical, they're not just hiring people that just say, I just want a job. So I just want you to keep that in mind. As far as the civil stuff, there are operators and so forth on the equipment that are out there, you know, now grading and so forth. Those are all local hires that, we, that they bought on. So we reach out to the community as much as technically possible and encourage all our subcontractors to hire as much local labor as possible. But given the, some of the stuff, it's hard to get, there's not gonna be a crane operator capable of lifting these turbines in the city of Lompoc. So those specialized jobs need to be filled by, by highly skilled technicians. Councilmember Vega. Uh, thank you for those responses, sir. You know, I, I'd like to, under this $250,000 community benefit, there's value to everything that, uh, what you're doing and what we're doing here. So again, I'm gonna go back to the public safety aspect of it uh, for the non-reimbursable cost here. Uh, what number would you figure is, is figured into this $250,000 that, uh, or is there a number for any responses that are not able to be recovered from the county. I'd like to at least have it referenced by you and your company. Well, there is some sort of value there, even though it's $250,000, uh, we have issues here also. Yeah, we don't want to tell you how to spend your money. It's your money. 
So, I mean, we're offering $250,000, which is a substantial amount of money, to do whatever you guys want to do with that money, whether where you choose to put it, whether it be responders, fire, public parks, or any way that you want to spend that money. Um, but it's not an insignificant amount of money. It's a large amount of money. Uh, and we leave it up to you to spend it at your discretion, what you feel best. Uh, I've gone back. When I first met with them, there was no benefit agreement. Uh, I met with Mr. Troop and agreed to go back to, to my company and negotiate a benefit agreement. We put something back together. I've been before the council several times. And each time I've gone back, I've asked for more money. Based on the comment you had last time was, I want to see, there wasn't a big discussion about this isn't close to being enough money. Your concern last time, Mr. Vega, was you wanted to see the money more up front. And we've written the agreement to get you exactly what you had asked for, to get that money more up front so it wasn't on the tail end. Mr. Mosby pointed out that he thought it was a little shy. He'd like to see something that was given uh, to first responders. So I went out and got an additional $100,000, bringing it up to $250,000. I feel that the, the agreement is more than fair. We're paying all the addition, all the costs that are involved in all the encroachments and stuff. We've addressed all uh, Mrs. Cordova's uh, concerns about all the legal issues. I, again, I really appreciate working with the city and city council there of getting all that resolved. We have spent the last 18 weeks to get to where we at. I urge you to um, accept the agreement the way it's written and uh, allow us to move forward. Uh, Mr. McCormick, you know, one of my issues are, are the longevity of the project. Okay, it's going to last hopefully many years uh, to provide green energy, but the access on I Street, um, how often do you project that these uh, infrastructure is going to have to be taken down through the years? Or is that even a, a, a thought, okay? Because obviously there's some trees coming down. I'd like to have some sort of an idea of the street lights and things. How often sure. can they be put up and you're projecting they're going to be taken down through the years? I mean, if you could reference that, that would help. So I'd like to also comment on 7th Street. The construction that was done on 7th Street was for the switch yard that was behind the, uh, uh, the city. That, that work is almost 100% complete. There's very little work there left. So I apologize for the traffic we knew. We reached out to those homeowners, by the way. Uh, we had a public meeting. We went to their homes, knocked on their doors. Uh, there was only one complaint filed with the county uh, during the construction of the switch yard. And we quickly addressed that and actually went out to the homeowners and knocked on the door and had a conversation with them and told them what was going on. So that construction is now complete. So that switch yard in 7th Street will not be used uh, like it was in the last three months. It's taken three months to construct a switch yard. I, I would like to address also that you talked about the, the water runoff and so forth, uh, Councilman Cordova, that uh, all the erosion control and all those methods were also put into the county plans and signed off uh, by the building department. So all the erosion measures, including runoff and so forth, have been included in all that package and that's actually been completed now as well. So that erosion control that you see on there has all been finished as well. The foundation for that switch yard is now being completed. So the only remaining work that's there is actually some switch gear that will eventually be put in the pads, uh, but there won't be construction traffic going back and forth. There won't be water trucks and so forth. So that portion is done. As far as I Street, I like to talk about the only reason we use I Street is for the transportation. Keep in mind, the only portion of I Street that's impacted by the transportation, the improvements that need to take place, are the delivery of the blades because of their length. So all the nacelles, the hubs, uh, the nacelle being the machine itself, the turbine itself, they all go up I Street and make ocean with no improvements whatsoever. So there's no impact to that. If we didn't have blades, we wouldn't be having this discussion because we wouldn't need an encroachment permit. We would just go. So we're only talking about the blades for these 29 turbines. That consists of removing four trees uh, that are located on the city's property on the corner there, taking out, there's a couple benches, there's four birdhouses, and there's a water valve uh, that needs to be relocated. As far as the city's encroachments, that's all we need. And I've supplied all that to the city and, and Craig and I have been working really closely about getting all that delivered. That delivery period is only for three months. At that time, everything will have been delivered. We'll go back, put back all the birdhouses, repair, uh, put the uh, landscaping back into place, replant the trees. 
and off we go. The chances are very slim that we will ever have to take down. The only reason we would ever have to go back up I Street with another encroachment permit, which we understand the possibility of, and we make sure that's in the agreement. We're not saying that this is a one-time encroachment permit. We're never going to bother the city again. In there, they understand that there is a possibility that we may have to bring another blade or something if it broke off or something catastrophic. We're not expecting that. It does not happen that often. So at that point, nothing will be done for the next 30 years. When they decommission the, uh, the turbines, those components are taken down uh, and cut up, and they come out on smaller trucks, so there's no impact to the city taking the decommissioning process. So we're only talking about three months of, of inconvenience. I understand it's inconvenience to the city, but we've delivered the traffic plan, we've delivered the encroachment permit, and I do want to say, as of today, we did get District 5, Caltrans District 5's permit, encroachment permit. That is the last of them. So we now have all the Caltrans permit, District 10, District 6, and District 5. District 5 being controlling the traffic lights that are on Ocean and I Street. There are, that traffic, those traffic lights will be taken down. There is a temporary system that will be installed and it will control the traffic just like it does right now. The only difference is, is we can roll the traffic lights out of the way to allow the truck to make the turn as it comes on the I Street, those traffic lights will be rolled out of the way. There'll be signal man there dealing with the traffic. Once the blade has made the turn, we put the traffic signal right back and we're back in operation. So it's a three month period. Um, thank you for your response. I guess my next question is to Mr. Troop. If I could ask, uh, Mr. Troop, we had these discussions that said there was ongoing maintenance agreements with other projects of these, this type uh, through the years. What's changed there, sir, um, in, your, in your thought process? Because in your homework, you discussed that there's ongoing uh, contributions sometimes throughout the project because of maintenance issues. Right, so, that was... So what's changed here uh, based on our staff report? On the staff report, just we've, both Jeff, the city attorney, and I have been continuing the discussions, and we reached a point that Strauss didn't want to make any other changes. So that's why we said, okay, we'll bring it back to council since you're the final decision makers on whether we go forward with as it is or requesting any more changes. So we, we've, I guess you could say, finalized our negotiations on that part of it. Um, I do think there's an ongoing cost. I don't think you know, um, that the 250 is, is quite the right number. And I think there's something that should be done on a yearly basis, annual basis. Um, but we weren't able to get to that level of the negotiation or discussions. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Mosby. So I think one of the problems we're running into is only two of the three parties are at the table here. You get a project being built in the county, you got a city, and then you got a developer. And I think there's, what, how, many, how many loads of cement coming out here, going through town? How many thousands of trips? I, 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 don't, I don't know. I don't have that number on top of my head. Uh, it, it's in the EIR, I forget, but I think there's a total of 10,000 total trips of, of vehicle trips going through the town. There was, there's hundreds and hundreds of truck loads, which is great. I, I, I appreciate what you're doing, but one of the calls and concerns people have had to me is we're going to have all these cement trucks going through town. And, and you know, in the old days when the, the quarry was working, it ran, the train ran twice a day and everything else. You know, we're kind of used to that. You have a little sleepier part of town that's, that has an impact, more than just the blades and such going through. But the real big complication we have is you're here, city's here, county's not. And, and, and that's what's unfortunate. And we're trying to figure out how a lot of the fees that you're paying in property tax would have been the mitigated number coming to the city that it's not happening. And I think that's really why we're doing it. And you are doing a good job of trying to get there. You came up with a quarter million. And you're gonna be paying, the, whoever ends up owning these, these windmills, to you guys or others, are gonna be paying a lot of property tax. And that's the real problem, is that, whether it's because the city was late at the table, but when you have these, these projects that happen, we have one over on the other side of the, uh, of the, the city that we have to provide a lot of service to. We get a lot of, other things that come from it that's in the county. 
And so we have a little taste of this already. And I think that's what everybody's pulling out right now. And that's why it's so difficult to get to the conclusion here. I think you've done a good job. You've, you've done a lot that we've asked. But a lot of the concerns are hitting us that are addressed by property tax. But, you know, unfortunately, the county hasn't stepped up at all. And if we sign this agreement, we have no more leverage against the county. You're kind of stuck in the middle, and that sucks, I understand. But I, I don't, is there any chance of, of the, the, you know, the city manager, city attorney making a contact with the county? Oh, and we, we can try it. I just, at the time when we brought the discussion up, I think we're all aware of our relationships between the city and the county. And I thought it's best to get sort of a neutral party in there who's bringing forth this new project. So, but uh, this could know, be a beautiful time for them to, you know, kiss and make up with us, you know? Yeah, we can try maybe, it. Maybe an opportunity for it. But I think a lot, this is what we're seeing. A lot of the, 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 the residents of this town are saying, again, in our backyard. And, and yeah, I appreciate that the schools are going to see some benefit. I appreciate that. But we're here talking about City Hall and city streets and such and, and our burden. And it's important for us to make sure that the city stays as whole as it can. And, and I think you've, you've done a good job. I appreciate you sharpening the pencil and coming up with this. Um, I, I appreciate you working with them to get together on this. And I think that is the problem that we're really having here. The, the, all, that inf all that stuff is taken care of in the encroachment permit. We're not asking not to have an encroachment permit. We're talking about three months of transportation, six months of construction all which is bonded, the roads are bonded. In the agreement, we agree to repair the roads, replace the roads. So there is no long-term 30-year impact to the city when dealing with six months or three months of transportation issues. All that stuff is covered in the encroachment permit and it all, is, is, all the money is allocated for it. If the street needs to be replaced, it will be replaced. It's not, sure. it doesn't go on for the next 30 years. It goes on for the next three months six months including construction so that stuff is is easily analyzed at the end of, of the construction period to find out what damage if any will take place so it's it's all addressed in the encroachment permit we're not asking to bypass that process we're asking we're putting up a community benefit for the for the benefit of the community not to offset construction that we're already offsetting with an encroachment permit and Part of it, if you had been built in the city, the impact fee component and other things would have been adjusted accordingly. Um, we're, the city's kind of stuck in the middle here. You're trying to pass through, and that's, that's what I'm getting at. And the long-term stuff down the road, there are long-term items that will happen. Um, whether you know, it's police or fire and our response in that capacity of going through. Uh, like I said, you, you, we are, we're stuck in the middle, you're stuck in the middle, and one other person's not really at the table. Um, and I think that's where we're, we're kind of uh, trying to figure out. And, it, and it's, there's a historical component to it. So you're kind of stuck in this middle. It's not, you know, again, I think you did a great job stepping up and, and, and helping out here. If there are no more questions for staff or Mr. McCormick, we will go to public comment. You may call in at 805-875-8201, 805-875-8201, and remember to mute your TV, PC, or radio when your call is put through. Good evening, you're live in the Lompoc City Council meeting. You have three minutes to provide public comment. All righty, thank you. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor and uh, honorable council members, uh, members of the community. My name is Scott Zimmerman, a uh, local resident, and just listening into all the uh, transaction uh, going on tonight in the back and forth with the uh, Strauss Wind Farm Project and this community benefit agreement. Uh, first, I'm not seeing a whole lot of benefit. It's, it's echoing a couple of uh, concerned citizens who have called in um, and uh, echoing some of the things that uh, Councilmember Cordova has um, touched on with providing long-term local jobs. Uh, you know, in, in the end, it was said there's six permanent jobs that will remain. Um, 
it just doesn't seem like enough to me is, is being done. I know there's, you know, indication issues with between the city and the, and the county. Uh, but I think the uh, trust land owners, uh, the, the applicant here could step up a little more, um, you know, and, and it's unfortunate that the city of Longboat did, wasn't involved in the initial uh, negotiations. Uh, all these different stipulations that have been proposed with, honestly, I mean, $250,000. You can break that up over years, this whole project. It's talking about $8,000 a year compared to the county reaping benefits of the, the tune of a million dollars per year. Hey, it, it, it's not a benefit. So, uh, Longpoke is, seems to be the one getting stuck with, you know, this eyesore off Megalio Canyon. People bike up there. Uh, the other citizens are, are calling in concerned and can't even get like a, a 10% uh, annually of what the, the county is going to be getting. And, and as far as the, the local workforce, there's uh, thousands of skilled and trained workers throughout this local community, uh, Central Coast, if you look at it as a whole. I mean, you got Diablo Canyon, nuclear power plant. You've got uh, skilled and trained carpenters. Uh, millwrights, electricians, plumbers, pipe fitters, masons, all doing that high-end work. Uh, operators the same at a nuclear power plant. Um, yeah, I think more to be done um, to, en- to engage the community and, and get more local hire. You know, bringing jobs that pay in a very standard way, like, like the union uh, provides uh, with those wages, benefits, Building a better community wealth, putting that all together, and, and really making this well-rounded for the uh, for the city and, and benefiting the community as a whole. Um, I, I think more needs to be done now uh, before anything gets gets us uh, uh, struck. So, thank you. Good evening. You're live in the Lompoc City Council meeting. You have three minutes to provide public comment. Thank you. Uh, I, my family owns a restaurant on I Street, and I'm concerned about the Strauss project closing I Street. I know the Strauss representative said there wouldn't be any closures, but I find this very hard to believe. In order for the 90 turbine blades to be moved up I Street, traffic signals, street lights, trees, and the center medium must be removed. Even if there are no street closures, a truck that is over 250 feet long would be a road closure. Customers who come to our restaurant come because they can get in and out quickly. This will not be the case if the road is closed or there is a huge truck blocking the road. The only way into our restaurant is I Street. The alley off Cypress is often blocked by trucks loading and unloading supplies. So this interest is, interest is not an option. The alley off H Street is a one-way alley and can only be entered from I Street, which wouldn't work if I is blocked. Strauss is going to be moving approximately 90 loads of blades. This is going to mean at least 90 days of lost income. We would not survive this kind of loss. Strauss needs to, Strauss needs to find another route that would not disrupt business or we need to be compensated for the loss of income due to road closures and blockages. Thank you. The number to call in is 805-875-8201, 805-875-8201. And remember to mute your TV, PC, or radio when you call is put through. Madam Clerk, did we have any written communications on this item? No, ma'am. And final call, 805-875-8201. 805-875-8201. And remember to mute your TV, PC, or radio. Hello, you're live in the Lompoc City Council meeting. You have three minutes to provide public comment. Thank you. Hi, my name is Leah from Lompoc, and I just wanted to remind everybody about the big picture. I don't know if you've noticed, but the skies have been really smoky lately. 
And that's because, not due to poor forest management, but because of climate change. So Lompoc has the opportunity to be a part of the solution. And I think we should all sort of look past, oh, we're going to miss a few lunches, or this is an existential threat that is threatening all of us and our kids and our grandkids and the future of the species. So why don't we all put our big city council pants on and just deal with the fact that you're not going to get everything you want. So just be happy you're part of the solution. The planet is warming. This is a way to stop that, hopefully reverse it. It's not perfect. I get it. And oh, poor Mr. B will lose his view. But let's think of the greater good of the planet. Okay. Have a great night. Good evening. You're live in the Lompoc City Council meeting. You have three minutes to provide public comment. Hi. I would just like to say uh, I agree with the previous person speaking. And, uh, yeah, it seems like everybody's thinking about the logistics of how it's going to go down and what an inconvenience that everything is going to be for that short term that it will be, but for the long term, that w I believe it will be a very, very good thing. Why wouldn't that project go on? And why wouldn't it, if it's going to provide me a benefit in the long run, that is a wonderful thing. And just take that into consideration. And... It's, yeah, it's going to be some logistical problems you have to face, but it will be over before you know it. I've been a contractor for since 1991 and never anything on that scale, but it all works out in the long run as long as you figure out what it's going to, the benefits in the long run. So... I'm sure it's going to be a good thing. Sounds like it to me. That's it. Eight zero five, eight seven five, eight two zero one, eight zero five, eight seven five, eight two zero one. And remember to mute your TV, PC, or radio when your call is put through. Seeing no additional calls, and we will close public communication on item seven and bring it back to council for discussion. Um, I, I do thank Strauss for continuing the discussion, and I realize that 18 weeks seems um, like a long time given how long this project is taken. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think this addresses long-term impact with only six permanent jobs. Yes, there's been a huge infusion during the early build-out and the continuing build-out. Yes, there is some long-term benefit to the community as a whole with green energy and wind power, but to the community itself, there is absolutely no benefit. There is a huge public safety response that will not be reimbursed because of mutual aid. And that additional burden for 30 years at 8,000 a year, I mean, granted, I know it's just six employees up there, but it's more than that that lives up that direction. And I'm getting phone calls from non-residents sharing with me their concerns at the traffic levels already, at the um, lack of communication coming from Strauss, the, the fact that the, the, the speeding and everything else going on has already disrupted their livelihood, and it's only going to get worse, yes, for a short period of time, and yes, some of those county residents may benefit from, because the county's benefiting from that energy creation, but the city of Lompoc isn't. We're not benefiting in any way long-term from this project. And so I unfortunately think your offer should, knowing the billions that are gonna be made off of this project with all the tax credit benefits and 
the energy production and all the partners that are coming in on this to you know, gain their green energy um, success stories, which we as Lompoc already meet some of the 2030 mandates because of our NCPA membership. So I understand all those goals, but my community goal is exactly the part that I highlighted in four. It says, any other impacts of the project on the city, such as the cost of first responder services during the life of the project, and any disruption to local businesses along the transport route shall be deemed mitigated by $250,000 payment under the Community Benefit Agreement. That's a drop in the bucket. It's not even a drop in the bucket. You, you say not insignificant. Yes, given our community and the impact on our community, that is an, an insignificant number. Given all of the budget discussions we've had the past couple of weeks on everything from needing radios for the department, uh, police department and cameras to a new fire engine, $250,000 doesn't cover the cost of anything. I mean, it won't even revamp one of our parks for us. So again, I go back to the idea of a community benefit agreement should be of benefit to the community and I'm just not seeing it with this offer. And I appreciate that you've gone back and forth and you've dug deep as according to you, but I, I just don't see it. So I'm, I'm having trouble supporting this without some negotiation from the county on our behalf, something as part of this agreement that says it's been uh, designated to us and, and we're getting 200,000 a year for the next 15 years versus 8,000 in a per year for the next 30 years in a lump sum of 250,000. So I, I just, I, I know you'd like to gift us something and this is much closer to a gift and I appreciate that, you, that you've seen that, but this, this is a, a long-term burden that we see zero benefits from and that's, that's what I'm looking at on this is that long-term burden. Council Member Mosby. So I went through and looked at the CUP for this project with the county. So the truck trips, it's 1,619 truck trips for 10 months. So we're 16,000 truck trips through the town. So think of the people living over on that side of town there. Um, it, it's not just a little nibble. Uh, there is that. And again, I, I still stay that we're in the middle and one of the partners is here for discussion. Maybe it's because we're a little late at the table, but we still hold a card and maybe we can engage in some of this discussion and maybe the city manager um, can move forward with that. I know, you know, we're, we're still not happy with, with, as per the staff report says, with item one in here, uh, you're like two, three, and four, so you're 75% of the way there. Yeah, I, I will say I'm a little disappointed when our last conversation, I was under the impression Strauss was going to be the ones talking to the county, not bringing forth some numbers that says here's what it's going to. I, I asked, would you talk to the county? It doesn't seem to happen, so I can get with our city attorney and do that. In, in, in how long away are they looking before they're, they're coming through on this project? Yeah, uh, the wind turbine components are sitting in the uh, port of Stockton. So we are waiting for the encroacher permit uh, from the city. We have not received the encroachment permit. I take it that they're not going to issue it without the community benefit. So uh, I don't know how to answer that question. Can, can maybe the city manager can discuss and bring this back to the next council meeting and, and you, maybe can, we, we, I, can, we can give the county administrator a call um, this week and See maybe we could, we maybe we could fill that out and, and, you know, time is of the essence at this time, so maybe we could step it up. I'd, uh, anything, anything, if the county, the CAO agrees to, would have to go to their board also for any approval, so there is some steps in between. But for one. clarification, the community benefit agreement doesn't impact the encroachment permit. That is a complete and separate entity, and as long as that's moving forward, they could receive their encroachment permit ahead of us signing a community benefit agreement. I mean, I don't think we're holding back the community benefit agreement before finishing the permit process, if I understand correctly. They're two separate items. 
Right. There's still, in, in fact, there was just communication back to Mr. McCormick today. There's still some outstanding necessary needs. You know, and there's been a go back and forth for some time now, and today's was another um, response that was necessary. Right, but they're two separate paths. So, yes. so one doesn't affect the other because one is the encroachment process they're going to have to go through no matter what. And whether or not we had a community benefit agree with, um, with them, they still have to go through the encroachment process in order to utilize I Street. Yes. Right. So we're not intentionally holding back the community benefit agreement as some sort of bargaining chip as to whether or not they get their encroachment process permit, correct? Correct. No, we're, we're, we're trying to move forward with the encroachment. Okay. I just want the community to be aware that this, this is not some sort of exchange in exchange for, because that's not what the community benefit agreement is designed to do. Is It's not designed to speed up something or show preferential treatment on something. It's literally a separate entity that has just literally what it is, a community benefit agreement. And that's why we work so hard to pull out the language that was trying to combine them all together. Correct. Correct, okay. Council member Mosby? I, I was still asking questions, but so what, what motivates Strauss if, if once they have their encroachment permit what motivates them at all to deal with a community benefit? That would be a, a good question. Zero, right? So without any leverage, because we, we aren't mandated by law to give them an encroachment permit, are we? Correct. So once we've given that, there's no need for them to give us any community benefit agreement. I mean, it, it is a possibility. I would hope, since we've gotten this far, that they would continue going down that road. <clears throat> but... We still have a ways to go on the on the encroachment, just seeing the different communication that went out today. Right, and the call it call it what you want to call it, but there is a mitigation component that's that's involved in here. I mean, that's why we're asking the community. You can call it community benefit, whatever you want, but it is actually a mitigation that we're asking for. Um, and well, I I have reached out to a gentleman who actually runs the NCPA, who's built wind farms before and that's been one of my concerns is the blades and he said he built one of the Tehachapi wind farms and said no they they break they do they don't break every single day but you definitely will have over the course of 30 years a number of blades that have to be you know taken up the the canyon again so it's not once every so many years so you know and I would I would say that there's probably a really good chance that we might even with the encroachment permit, we'd probably be maybe still be trying to discuss this and move forward, and it, it might not move forward at all. That's a possibility, I mean, it's, yeah. It's, I mean, there is an easement aspect that is <clears throat> lying in here and understanding that, that you pay for an easement component, which is part of the encroachment permit, and you do pay to use well, it. And, and I did, and Mr. McCormick can vouch for it, I did send him in February saying that this is not just I Street, that we also need to see is F Street. Um, I reiterated that, we've sent that message not too long ago, that we haven't seen anything from F Street. So that is still a possibility that they could use F Street. Um, they would have to do the encroachment permit and, and everything on that one too, though. Thank you. Councilmember Cordova. Um, so I, it, at the last meeting, um, I said, you know, I had an issue with the fact that we were being offered the 150 and that it was going to come at the end of the project. Um, I also brought forward the, the fact that I had an issue with the city having to waive its right to future law suits um, because I didn't feel that there's any amount of value, I said, that would ever take that right away from our residents. So I did state that. Um, however, I, I was glad to hear that. Um, that Mayor Osborne just said, these are two separate issues. And I really think that to stay fair and honest, we should be handling these as two separate issues. I do get the components um, that have been discussed here with the public safety. I do, I do agree. I do think it's, it's, there's, an, it, there's a potential issue there. Um, but I think that both city and, and I sat with the city attorney before coming into to this session, um, any blade that's coming in in the future, there will be an encroachment permit at that time, which will pay for that at that time. So, so I just I want to kind of I feel the I feel compelled to to clarify some of these issues too because I feel like 
um, we continue to, to discuss them when, when there is a potential answer that has been provided for some of these issues, maybe not for all. Um, but one of the things that, that, that has come up is that there's been 18 weeks of discussion, which seems to have been stated by Strauss and also um, acknowledged by staff or a council. Um, but we haven't been dealing this with the council for 18 weeks. So clearly, I, I do feel that our city has been in discussions. We have been aware. We have been at the table. So I feel the need to clarify that as well. Councilmember Starbuck. Who's getting the energy credits with this project? Well, it might answer that one. I think they have a contract. Correct. The, the, uh, the power is being sold to MCE, and they're uh, an offtake. They will take the, they get the credits as well as the energy, and uh, so we're under contract to deliver this power to those guys uh, under contract. I'm just wondering if a, a random thought if we could somehow worm our way into that credit so we're not forced later to do something expensive and maybe maintain electric rates. I mean, if we're not going to get money, we're not going to get property tax, maybe we can get green credits. And we actually, George Morrill, our interim uh, utility director, is actually talking a little bit with Monterey about such a thing. I don't know if I don't see him here tonight. May I comment on the encroachment permit? Um, I sent Craig all the information on the encroachment permit more than two months ago. There has been zero correspondence between me and Craig up till an hour, not even an hour, a half hour before I walked into chambers. So when they say they have questions or they still have any concerns, there were no concerns raised prior to me walking into chambers at six o'clock when I received the call that, oh, there's a few, and Craig's phone call with me, there's only a few things left to discuss one dealing with, with, with highway patrol and, and Caltrans. All the questions have been provided. Uh, more than two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, I sent uh, Mr. Troop the thing on F Street. You've got the entire report from head to toe. I've supplied all that to you. Matter of fact, I sent it twice. Um, I'll, I'll find the email. I, don't, I disagree on that one. So I sent that to him twice. So he has all of F Street, why it can't be used. No. F Street cannot be used because we can't get the blades uh, through those turns. So they've had all that information. I just find it ironic when we say it's not tied to anything that I haven't heard from the city for, I, don't, I still don't know the status of the encroacher permit. I only found out that they have another question a half hour before I walked in to talk about my community benefit agreement. Okay, thank you for that. So what I'm hearing from council is that we would like to um, request that we engage the county at uh, this discussion in a more direct manner and look to increase either a contribution through the property tax that is coming and have it be a part of the community benefit agreement as part of documentation. Um, is that the clarity I'm getting, Councilmember Mosby? Yes, if it continues to the next meeting. It sounds like the encroachment permit's not done, but please continue staff moving and, and clarification on F Street and you know, everything else that needs to be done. You've heard some of the questions they've asked. Staff has mentioned, as, as well as the city manager. Um, everybody, please, let's, let's try to get this rounded up as fast as we can. So, um, yes, Madam Mayor. So I'll make that a motion and take yours as a second. And any other discussion? Seeing none, let's vote. And that passes 5-0. Our last item that was added at the beginning of the meeting is a ballot collection box license agreement from the county and will be presented to us by our city attorney, Mr. Malave. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is the item that the council added to the agenda tonight by a vote right after the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, we do have a somewhat quirky rule in our city council handbook that says if we add an item to the agenda that it has to be considered after 9 p.m. And luckily enough, 
If I Didn't talk long enough about this. If you talk this, long enough. <laughs> it'll pass 9 p.m. It will be past 9 but, p.m. Uh, I'll just start the staff report and then the council can start considering it after 9. Um, you have before you on the dais the proposed contract with the county for the installation of a ballot drop box at the city library. And this proposed contract was also posted on the city's website uh, tonight so that, the, so that the public has the ability to look at it as well. But this is simply just an agreement um, so that the county can place a ballot collection box at the city library in between the bike rack and the book return box out in front of the library next to the parking lot. Uh, the county would like to place this there uh, between the dates of October 5th and November 3rd. And on November 3rd, um, the, the box will be there until the last voter who is in line at 8 p.m. has deposited his or her ballot on November 3rd. Uh, the county is requiring as part of the agreement that the ballot drop box will be bolted to um, what looks like concrete sidewalk flooring here. Um, and then at the time that the county removes those bolt holes, uh, that they will fill the holes back to uh, level as they were before. Additionally, the county is requiring that exterior lighting, if it is available in the area around the drop box, shall remain on during periods of darkness overnight so that people can return their ballots at nighttime. Um, so this is a period of almost a month that the box will be there to accept ballots this year for the election, October 5th to November 3rd. And we're just looking for city council direction to authorize the city manager to enter this agreement with the county. Um, to the city manager, um, I'm guessing that we've reviewed this and we are okay with the holes being yes. created and filled in and that there is the lighting they request. I believe that is a light pole there at the far edge. So that is on 24. Um, I, I can verify the lighting, but I did talk with our library director and she said that was an appropriate place at this point in time. If we were completely wide open, it would be a little different, but there aren't as many bicyclists and students and everything. So this would be fine for um, what we can do. And then we'll verify about the, 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 light, the light. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Councilmember Member um, Are we going to have public comment after that? Or yeah. it's inappropriate right now then? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Council Member Mosby. Well, it's nice to see the county can get things done fast when they want to, right? I don't see a negative declaration or landscape plan or the three multiple sequas and everything else. But uh, hopefully they can be this fast for you uh, between meetings. Any other questions for staff before we go to public comment? Seeing none, we'll go to public comment. The number to call is 805-875-8201. 805-875-8201. Remember to mute your TV, PC, or radio when your call is put through. Due to the late nature of this, I doubt we have any written communication. Thank you for that clarity. Once again, the number to call on this item, 805-875-8201, 805-875-8201. And remember to mute your TV, PC, or radio when your call is put through. Seeing no calls, we will close public comment and bring it back to council. Council Member Mosby. Motion to approve. I'll second it. It's been moved and seconded. Any other questions? Seeing none, let's vote. That passes 5-0.
Any additional written communications? No, ma'am. Thank you. The final oral communication for this meeting is two minutes maximum. You may call in at 805-875-8201, 805-875-8201, and remember to mute your TV, PC, or radio when your call is put through. Again, final oral communication, two minutes maximum for this council meeting. Seeing no one call in, we will close oral communication and bring it back to council comments and meeting reports. Council Member Mosby. I want to make one comment about the city manager's report and uh, give a shout out to the uh, Mr. Dean Albro, the management service director, on, on his numbers and as such. He was only off by 1.8% in your estimates of uh, projected revenues that we had coming in and that's during these wild times that's uh that's pretty good to, to get that close and some of the important numbers that are this is page five of the city manager's report uh you know the cannabis tax was 983,000. uh tot tax was a million less than estimated but uh property tax and uh well, the sales tax was off a little bit, but property tax was pretty close to, to even what we budgeted. So City of Lompoc, we, we're faring a lot better than a lot of communities, and kudos for your, uh, um, your numbers, pretty spot on. I'd like to also give this to staff. I did a little research on body cameras and in-car video grant funding. So I've, I got a guide. This is the 2020 guide. I imagine there's a lot more information out. There was a there was a lot of potential grants out there for that. So I know it's 2020, but this company WatchGuard, uh, there's a number of other companies out there and such uh, that can help us. I know it takes time for for us to uh, you know get grants and such, but it also does the in-car video and uh, they had an option out there using a, a cell phone that connected to the the cloud. It was like $50 a month it costs to run that way with redaction software and um, a, a lot of things that are out there. So I, th I think we need to keep doing some research and, and likewise, it, this, I'd, I'd like to, we, we had a report from the, the police chief on what it would cost for him to do it. And I've researched other communities and some other communities run it through their city attorney's office to do the, um, public records request for the, the cameras and stuff. So I'd like to make a council request that the city's attorney's office come back with a report to show us what, what it would cost for them to do this uh, in, in, you know, see, see what we can do. Let's start looking at our options uh, that are out there that we can, that we can move forward with. Um, in, if, if he's in agreement with, is that something that the city attorney would be in agreement with? Yes, I can definitely come back with a report on what the cost of that might be. I, I, maybe some no, benefits. I can look asked. into it. It could be less, it could be more. Okay. We can well, do a report. So maybe if I could get two others to go along with me to see something like that. No, I'd give you a second. I'll give you a third. And I thought I had one other thing, but thank you. Councilmember Starbuck. I have no reports. Thank you, Councilman Cordova. Um, and, and thank you, Councilman uh, Mosby, for addressing that. Um, as a reminder, too, when we discussed this um, and the police chief brought it forward, he was in full support and in favor and actually asked the council to, to, to find the funding, and he is completely for it. So I want to make sure that we know and that we understand that um, there wasn't a hesitation in that sense. Um, council did discuss, and as a matter of fact, um, on my notes I show that I requested for it to come back before the end of the year or by the end of the year because there was additional um, additional information that the chief uh, was still waiting on that he was going to get back. Um, so I, I, I think 
with the information that Council Member Mosby just brought forward, I think it is very important for us to continue to move forward on that and be able to provide that service. Um, I do want to make a, a council comment in regards also to the open market or what we refer to um, in the past or lovingly as the swap meet. Um, you know, with that, my uh, opposition on that was never to the actual open market, and my comments were never even related to that. My comments were related to the cost that staff put on the staff report as to what it would cost to maintain that or to provide the services to continue that forward. So I just want to clear that up because I don't have any opposition to the, to the open market being um, brought back. Councilmember Vega. And nothing to report. Thank you. Um, I attended the 9-11 memorials that were held by our Lompoc Fire Station 51, as well as the county fire station up on Burton Mesa. I was invited by Pro Farms for their donation to the food bank. I want to thank them for donating nearly um, 60,000 pounds of produce, valued at over 40,000, to the local food bank. I attended the Community Action Committee uh, board meeting as council appointee and the Santa Barbara legislative calls, both the 3rd and the 10th, as well as the Santa Barbara County Mayor and City Manager quarterly media via Zoom. I want to give a shout out to Chief Mariani. It is his fifth year today, it is the fifth anniversary of him signing on with us, and I want to say thank you, and I look forward to another year, so don't go anywhere. So thank you. And last but not least, um, Community Action um, has converted its name to Communify. It was a targeted um, research and revamp of their goal and mission, which hasn't strayed. It's actually just been strengthened and refreshed as addressing contemporary social issues that disproportionately impact low-income individuals and families, such as social inequities, civic and voter engagement, climate change, and digital divide, as an example. They have a new website. Please visit it at www.comm unifysb.org. Um, they are supporting so much going on in our community. They are an organization that if you're having difficulty paying your utility bills, they have a program that helps you easily um, apply for and get the funding to do that. They are supporting many of our seniors in the area and continue to provide the um, brown bag lunches as well as other programs. They are still in need. Doing fundraising is very difficult this year with um, the pandemic. So again, visit their website. If you can, please support them. Um, there is a donate button that is very easy to find on that page and, and support what they're doing in our community. That completes my report for this meeting. We will adjourn to the next Lompoc City Council meeting of October 6th, 2020 at 6.30 p.m.